Ramakrishna. Uh, he is the co-founder and CEO of Ramde. Uh, a brief introduction of us. Uh, Mr. Ramakrishna is a software consultant by profession. He comes with 10 years experience in consulting. He holds a degree in product, production engineering from Nagarjuna University. He worked for several software companies in India and the UK. His last job was with uh, Vignet UK as principal consultant. He quit Vignet in 2008 when he co-founded Ramde. For a year after co-founding Ramde, he worked as head of technology at IFMR Trust and was responsible for technology solutions for the ICICI foundation and its ecosystem. In 2009, he joined Rangde as CEO and has been working full time with Rangde ever since. Uh, Mr. Ramakrishna firmly believes that social entrepreneurship in India needs an impetus and that there is a strong case for inclusive business models leading to an equitable growth. So, let us welcome Mr. Ram. Uh, Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Smith, for the fantastic introduction. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I will quickly run you through, you know, I've had you know, very informal discussions with many of you. Uh, and let me quickly run you through a, a journey of how Rangli started and what was the, the thought or the thought process which went behind it. And uh, and then you know we'll look at challenges, some of the challenges you face, and then with that we'll throw the uh, floor open and you know I'll, I, I want to be as interactive as possible. And sometimes I want to do a bharkata, you know, have you know, a session where there's a lot of interaction and uh, whole idea is to give you answers, information. Uh, which you are uh, trying to find. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so we can have the lights on, and I can see each one of you. Uh, it all started when uh, I and Smitha, uh, Smitha is the other co-founder of Rangde. We're also related to me, a husband and wife. Uh, uh, so in 2004, we got married, and went to the United Kingdom on a small consulting assignment which was supposed to last for two months and two months became four and four months became two years. I switched jobs, I moved on to become a, a rather joint vignette in the India headquarters and then, well, but before that what happened? The whole idea was that even before that I was working for several software companies in Bangalore uh, I used to uh, volunteer with a lot of non-profits, but then why was I doing that? Let's go a bit, you know, further down. And somewhere during my school days, you know, very motivated by stories of anything or anybody who goes to, you know, the media used to report about somebody doing something fantastic in the social space. Clearly, we had our role models like Mother Teresa, but there were other not so uh, you know, typical role models who uh, there are many stories. I mean, I'm sure we also come across these stories, right? Where you know there is somebody who's got a fantastic career. They drop everything they do. They come back to India. They set up uh, a non-profit. There are many such examples. Very inspirational. Very inspiring. There was this, always this thought that they have to get into this. I have to get into this space at some point. The question was when and what is it that you know. I would like to do. That was not too clear. So as things progressed, I, uh, so when I, you know, well, there was something which was very common between myself and Smitha, which was that both of us had a similar desire to do something in the social space. Again, what in the social space, that didn't really matter. But the idea was to do something in a very refreshing manner, in a manner which can scale, which can have a you know, large impact, countrywide. You know, because in a country like India, you know, it really is important to think on a large scale. So when, you know, I remember the day when I told my parents that I'm, you know, I'm going to the United States. So, I, you know, there were many, you know, there was a lot of peer pressure when I was graduating. Most of my, you know, batchmates, they left the country soon after they graduated. Many of them, in fact, had not even seen, you know, New Delhi or Hyderabad. They straight away left and they went to New York or San Jose or San Francisco, whatever. The thought 
was that you know, when I told my parents that I'm leaving, you know, I, you know, they felt that, you know, because in their peer group, all this, you know, the, the sons and daughters who were left, uh, they never came back in some sense, you know. They, they, they used to come back from vacation, so they were all very uh, disappointed, you know, and I was like, what happened, you know, I'm just, I'm just going abroad, you know, for maybe a couple of months. They said, no, 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 we know, you know, all that, no, 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 it's okay, I mean, you can go and all of that, so. Um, they said, you know, you know, we said, no, well, you know that, right, you want to come back to India and do something in the social space. He said, yeah, yeah, we know that, no, it's okay, you can go and, and, and then we actually, you know, made a promise to ourselves that we'll be in the United Kingdom, no more. Now, it didn't really matter whether it's UK or Australia or US, but we said, let's stay abroad for two years. The idea was to see the world, experience different cultures, understand their problems, sort of, you know, uh, and then come back and do something in the social space. Again, you know, never had any clear understanding of what that would be. So with that sort of a background, we went to the kingdom, we lived in a village four miles from Oxford called Kidlington. A very beautiful village. It's also a village where Richard Branson lives. Uh, we didn't know that. He was... Uh, we shared the village with him. Uh, and he was... Uh, well, not he, but we were there for close to two years and then we decided that, okay, now what? Should we just drop everything and come back to India? and set up something in the social space. Again, something was not defined. In its simplest form, this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to essentially uh, stay in a village which is 60 to 80 kilometers from Hyderabad or from Bangalore. You know, I am from Hyderabad, the wife is from Bangalore. Uh, and adopt that village. Now, very strategically identify this village for all its uh, deficiencies. Economically backward, socially backward, people, the district collector has written off that village saying that, you know, I can't do anything, I can't do anything to turn around this village. You know, go to that village, stay in that village, set up a house, build a house, rent a house, and then work with the community and transform the village. You know, see, the, the most important thing is that we can talk a lot in closed door, you know, rooms, but when it comes to actual doing, and that's where you actually learn. So we said, so let's get our feet and hands wet and try and get, uh, to really understand what it really means to bring about a change. It's very easy to say that, no, well, India is still a developing country, what a bit more harsh, you can say that India is a third world country. Right? Uh, we have very good companies, so we don't have to really worry, so whatever. So that was the original thought. That. So in 2006, we started really thinking, is, it, is, that, is this the moment? Is this the moment of truth that we drop everything, go back to India, and getting a job was not very difficult. My, I, I, want, you know, I, had a, sort of, I made up a pitch, and my pitch was, I'll go to one of these companies, the top IT companies, and say that, give me your most toughest customer, and I'll manage your customer remotely, 60-80 kilometers away from your office, and allow me to work from home. So, and that, that's what I used to do in Vignette. Uh, I, I was part of professional services. So, and, and then we said, okay, hang on. We have, you know, uh, so Smita also used to work. Uh, she had, in fact, a government job. She used to work for the Oxford Shire County Council. Uh, she's a social worker by profession. And we said, okay, now what do we do? Can we try and see if we can implement a, 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 a create a social venture? which will have a far-reaching impact. So started, you know, we had thoughts. You know, there were a lot of motivation at different points in time. Uh, there were a lot of incidents which motivated us. So we started penning them down. And there were these three thoughts, four thoughts which came up. The first one was, my favorite, was child labor. Um, I think all of us you know, know this problem exists in India. But I just want to give you context to what extent it exists in India. It, ex it ex exists to such an extent, to such a large extent, that it's it has become more of a social norm rather than a social evil. To give you an example, in the film Rande Basanti, there's a small shot in which Amir Khan says, Chote ek kap chai 
And the reason why you know Rakesh and Prakash pair up for that shot is to give it, give the movie a sense of realism. The movie is all about realism, right? Problem is that even the media has started to not report child labour as a social evil. The fact of the matter is that today, if a child gets married, that will be breaking news in all some of the top channels we have in India. But the same television studio channel oh, would not report it, even if they had a child labour inside their office premises. So I think there's a big, you know, what is newsworthy versus what is not, what is socially important versus what is not. I think that's a debate you can go on, but I think that's a just a quick sense of what, what the gravity of the problem is. On the other hand, uh, uh, so so you know, so how do we fix this? So idea was very simple. It's a for-profit initiative, uh, social initiative again, to certify institutes, including IIT. IITs. So, yeah. if I just take a sure. uh, You mentioned that uh, it's about the media, right? I mean, like yeah. you, say, you say the media is uh, putting a barrier to you know, child labor and all this. Yeah, stuff. yeah. But I beg to differ in okay. the sense that, uh, let's say, a, a boy who, uh, you know, like, boy who starts working at a very small age, mm -hmm. uh, such, such people, the, the children who start working at college do it mainly to earn their bread. Mm -hmm. They don't do it as a forced uh, sure, thing. Sure. Right? Yeah. So oh, marriage is something which is forced upon you by, you know, like your family or sure. your sure. So that's not that's not a requirement for survival. Sure. But if you don't have food in your stomach, sure. that's you need the, that to happen, right? You need food. So you need the money for that. Sure. So, What's the easiest way to get food? You have to buy the food. So you buy the food, like you work, you earn. I mean, so you just can't blame something which is part of the system. The system has evolved in such a way. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously media can, like you know, but thing is, there are other things as well. Absolutely, I think it's a very, uh, it's a heavily loaded question. I'm so happy that you asked this question. Uh, let me answer that. Please understand, intrinsically, you know, intrinsically, if, if, if a child were to be asked, do you want to study? Do you want to, you know, get life skills? You want, you know, the answer would be yes. And I think with our own limited experience, about two years of working in the field, we've noticed that the child is actually forced to come out of education. It's not the other way around. Sir, can yes. I just make another point here? Sure. Uh, I have noticed, I mean, it's just my observation, people who have a very secure childhood, uh, people who are given proper food, education, everything, have very, uh, I mean, no offense, no offense, but the way the real world operates, I mean, for the last two days, we have seen the way we students interact, like, you know, when for professionals and like old people, Sit there and like you listen to someone speak, you start to realize, oh, this, this is a kid, you know, like he doesn't know what he has been there. So that's the first thing. And it's, I feel people who are working and who are uh, earning their you know, livelihood from a very young age get a better uh, you know, uh, taste of life than people with productive talents. Okay. So, I mean, um, I may not be very clear with my description here. Oh, sure. But I think you get the point, right? I get the point. I think, I think it's entirely fair. You know, I think we should, I mean, if you were to take a you know, quick uh, uh, view at how it works in the US, I'm sure most of you will probably, you know, land up in the US, or, you know, and if you indeed go for your master's, or, you know, if you don't have scholarship, then you, the students do work, right? And, and even if you can look at Oxford, London, wherever you go, you find teenagers working in coffee shops. So that's fine. I think the point is, the point I'm trying to make here is that, I think we need to understand is, is that there is a, you know, if you exercise your choice, if you exercise your choice to work in a coffee shop, yeah, and, and do it, and exercise your free will, and not because of economic deprivation. See, please understand, poverty is very debilitating in nature. 
It weakens you. It weakens even your self-confidence. You're willing to take any amount of yeah, whatever, whatever, purely because you don't have the confidence to answer back. Right? I think the context is that. The whole idea was... So don't you think that rather than labor, we should attack poverty and illiteracy? And absolutely. Labor? Absolutely. So that's the thought. So this is one of the thoughts we were penning down. Uh, this was 2006. Child labor, we thought that if, you know, if an IIT Guwahati can certify itself and say the campus is child labor free, you're making a very strong statement. Yeah? The whole idea was that. If Infosys, Infosys, all their campuses, Narayan Murthy makes a statement, my gut feel is today, Narayan Murthy cannot make a statement and sign on it and say that all my campuses are child labor free. Yeah? That's the whole idea. It was a business model, it's up for grabs, go ahead and implement it. But the whole idea is it's a for profit model, you start certifying them and you start charging for a, you know, you certify for a fee. Uh, so, that was the whole idea. We would set up this organization to be for profit, build a strong brand, have a great set of advisors, uh, build a uh, highly visible brand, and certify our organization. Cash flow positive from day one. Um, the second idea we sort of worked on was, or looked at seriously, was domestic help. Domestic help, again, if you look at it from an Indian context, every Indian household has a domestic help. If it doesn't have, then it means two things. Either the house is haunted or it's vacant. Yeah. Uh, and the whole idea is there that domestic help, uh, the, the workforce, is pretty much the look at the CK Prahal's pyramid, they form at the absolute base of the pyramid. They don't have access to fair wages, they don't have access to fair uh, uh, what working conditions. There are many instances, we have seen on and off in the media, uh, where there is exploitation which happens. Third, the other important thing is the access to education, access to finance, you know, and they are pretty much part of our ecosystem. So the idea was that to build a initiative which would be an alternative to domestic health in the form of ethical housekeeping. So that was another idea we were dabbling with. Third idea was social media. Um, how many of you think in, in, in this room that India is not a third world country? Uh, is it because I already said that? <laughs> How many of you think? All of you agree that India is a third world country? You, don't, you think it's not? It's not? How many of you think it's not a third world country? Can I have your hands up please? Oh, you also think? I think all of you, you know, uh, you also think that. Okay. okay. Problem is, I think, I think, I think what you're thinking is absolutely right. I'm happy and, you know, I'm quite happy that you actually, you know, raise your hands. The problem is that the perception of India for people who live in India is different and especially for all those people who raise their hands because of the fact that you don't have access to information, access to data points which actually show India in its true colour. And let me just elaborate this a bit. Any award winning documentary which is made in India gets showcased in all the international film festivals. When it comes, when it, but the irony is that if that same ordering documentary which is built on poverty, squalor, whatever, it's never shown in India. As, as such, the perception we have of India is distorted. So the whole idea was to set up the social media enterprise to showcase award-winning documentaries, have debates which are non-political, non-religious in nature, and run it like a website, even it could be a channel, a TV channel, eventually a TV channel, with six, six hours of such program. The third idea, the fourth one, we stumbled upon thanks to Professor Mohamed Yunus winning the Nobel Peace Prize. This was in 2006. We were like, oh, this is fantastic. Wow, you know, Mohamed Yunus has done such a great thing from Bangladesh. Bangladesh deserves my credit and also deserves Mohamed Yunus. Again, the perception problem. We felt India doesn't need my credit. 
We started Googling. All we did was Google, a simple Google. What are the list of search results which said otherwise? Essentially said, India needs a lot of my credit. In fact, the uh, estimated at that point in time, the demand for my credit was 200,000 crores. All the microfinance institution initiatives, government and public, and private initiatives put together, they added up to close to 10% of it. He said, fine, there's an opportunity here. So what, who are the players? So we looked at the model, and we realized that, as Brahmadunas puts it beautifully, what the, you know, let's understand what microcredit itself is. And there are a lot of definitions putting it up. Microcredit is all about giving a small loan to a person from a low-income household in order to help it escape poverty. Yeah? Now, if this definition is important, and we need to actually fix this definition and then say, okay, can we do a, you know, build a business model around it? So that was a whole idea. We got into it, and we also realized that the interest rates were anywhere from 28 to 36 percent, and uh, the repayment rate, astonishingly, was 9800 percent. So that was the whole idea, uh, and we said, okay, we researched it, we, we, and we, we figured out that we need, we spoke to uh, experts in the industry, and then we realized that, is there a case for us to lower the interest rate, and also reach out to more communities in, in more geographies, and offer them microcredit, and help them come out of poverty. That's how the story of Rangi Star. Uh, research and we looked at models in the US and the UK and we felt there was a strong case to build a peer-to-peer -peer micro lending platform which will ensure there's a constant supply of capital, low-cost capital, and because of which we could actually pass on the benefit of low-cost capital directly to the borrowers. We started uh, putting a team together. Uh, so this all happened when I was, we were still in Oxford, you know, in Kidlington. So we thought that, okay, what do we do? So Smita came to this brilliant idea of uh, saying that uh, uh, she would uh, apply to this national lottery fund. So the, you know, there's a lot of this national lottery in the UK, and like, you know, there's a lot of sweet stakes and all of that. So all the profits from national lottery are actually set aside in the fund which are uh, used to fund social projects. So, uh, and uh, her, her reporting manager uh, was one of the advisors to this fund. So we said, okay, let's apply. And uh, it was for 200,000 pounds. And we, uh, we said, okay, what? and we waited and waited. And this was sometime in 2007. We didn't we didn't get funding and we said, okay, now what? Are we going to wait for another and apply for another fund? Or are we going to get started? Because by then, we had validated the idea by talking to experts in the space. We had also registered a domain name. We also spent a lot of time building the brand, you know, uh, visually, you know, saying that, okay, we have to build a brand like this, we have communication strategy, this is the way we So, you know, the excitement was a bit too much for us to say that, okay, we're going to now find the money. We said, okay, can we put our own money into this? We said, we said okay, so how much is that amount? We looked at our savings, we said, okay, 6,000 pounds is what we can set aside and forget about it. Forget about it only after we have tried and put everything we have on the table and make sure that it works. We said, we put everything. You know, if it requires for me to quit my job, move back to India, we'll do that. If both of us have, both of us have to quit, be without a you know, salary for whatever X amount of time, we'll do that. But the idea was to put everything on the table and make it work. Fair. If it fails, we'll come back crashing. That's fine. We'll write it off thinking that we went on a very expensive vacation to Switzerland. Which we never did. Because many people went and they said it's very expensive. So we said, okay. Uh, that's what it will cost you. Huh? So you know the number now. Uh, so we said, okay, so we decided to uh, start working. So, very important, again, we didn't have a business plan. I think uh, we had a, a notional idea, a very, you know, a very vague, 
but a very strong uh, sense that we have to work with some boundary conditions. So first boundary condition was the six thousand pounds. Second one was okay, how do we spend three thousand pounds operations, three thousand pounds for technology. Now once we fix this boundary condition, we said okay, now we need to find people who are going to buy this vision of ours. Started hunting around, we used to get up at 5 in the morning every day because of time difference and then connect people, say good morning everybody in India, wake them up and say okay, can we help somebody, you know, can you refer us somebody who can help us with a creative design. Uh, very tough to find good designers and then technology again, so started interviewing you know, potential partners. So many of them were like two year old startups. They said, okay, sir, you know, this sounds like a brilliant idea for India. We are all, you know, and we are in for this. So, but can you tell us how much we should charge you? You know, I said, okay, I think we have a small problem here. I think we I think we're not ready for the partnership. Went on, it went on for some time, and every day we used to Google and call up people, old friends. One day we got introduced to a technology as well as a creative partner. The creative partner was great, we looked at the portfolio online, they were near the technologies. And we sent them an email and we responded back, we said, Sir, can you give us a 50% discount? And the conversation ended. No response. We said, oh, I think we should be a bit too early. But we said, we don't have money, can you give us... So there was no publish. Then this technology partner got introduced to a, a technology firm. They said they would uh, like to partner and they were like a set of bunch of guys who are from Infos Infosys, 15 years with Infosys, they were starting up and they looked like a good fit. But 15 years with Infosys and they would, uh, obviously their rates would be much higher. So we said, oh, sorry, we can't afford you. But they insisted that we should give them our business requirements to them and we gave the business requirements to them. The companies in Sansi and then they came up with uh, uh, a quote which essentially said, uh, so basically they said, you know, we understand your problem. You don't have money. We said, yeah, we don't have money. So we will give you a fixed bid quote. Yeah, as opposed to uh, a T and then, you know, timing material. Your fixed bid. You tell us how much uh, then it's easy, right? I mean, you say, it's a yes or a no. So we gave the business requirements document. I, I thought Smitha how could I use cases. So she wrote all the, you know, partly. And we gave the use cases. They got back to us. They said, you know, this is going to cost you nothing more than 33,000 pounds. She said like, okay. I mean, okay, this is a sign, you know. We should just drop everything cut our losses and say that okay we have saved around 4,000 pounds, we have spent only 2,000 pounds and you know. That was not to be the case and we said you know sorry I can't afford it blah 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 and all of that and they said okay will you, first question will you pay us at all? Said, yeah we'll pay you. Second question was then tell us how much you will pay and then leave it to us whether we will take up the project or not. And uh, that's when uh, I wrote a very long email explained them what we're trying to do, uh, why uh, it's important that they should reduce the cost. And uh, I, think, I think I remember the CEO of this company who told me that, but please don't remove a, you know, uh, a zero from that number, 33,000 pounds. So I said, okay. And then I wrote this email which I said, I did not remove a zero, I removed a number. So. <laughs> I removed three out of it and we get three thousand pounds. It sort of made a lot of sense. 